All right, let's talk about the gastric phase of digestion. So the word gastric implies stomach. So on our diagram, we had our esophagus coming down and that sort of led into this organ like that, that there was then going to lead into the first part of the small intestine. So here's our stomach. Uh, just some words for you. This very first part of the stomach is called the cardia. This upper part is the fundus. This is the body. And then this is the antrum. I'm not going to hold you responsible for those, but in case you hear those that terminology used, that's what we're that's what we're getting at. Um, and one other thing we need to talk about before we talk about the details of the gastric phase is the idea of the gastric glands. So if we took a very close-up view of the wall of the stomach, it's divided up into a bunch of layers, including muscular layers. But here, in this layer called the mucosa, which is the innermost part, in here is the lumen of the stomach, we have these little pits, the gastric pits. And the cells down here in the bottom of the gastric pits are what are known as gastric glands. It's the cells down in those gastric glands that are going to secrete the things that make the stomach interesting. We're going to talk about four different kinds of cells that are down in the gastric glands. So in here we have the G cells, the parietal cells, the enterochromaffin like cells, and the chief cells. These uh, ones with this incredibly long name are usually just called ECL cells, enterochromaffin-like. I don't actually know what enterochromaffin is, but anyway. So, these cells are all doing stuff that interacts with each other, so this, there's a fairly complicated interaction going on here, but just make a note of those types of cells and then we'll kind of show how they work together. So here in the gastric gland, We're kind of going to start talking about it with the G cells. So the gastric gland gets input from the autonomic nervous system, specifically more the parasympathetic, which influences the enteric nervous system. And that is going to act on these G cells. The G cells primarily produce a hormone called gastrin. So gastrin is this hormone, it's, then, it's going to secrete it into the blood, but it's going to mostly, mostly, not entirely, act on stomach cells. And they, they secrete this in response to this stimulation from the enteric nervous system. Also, as food enters the stomach, these G cells, which are largely up in this area, as that area stretches out with the food coming in, that stretch also causes gastrin secretion. So gastrin, acts on both the parietal cells and the enterochromaffin-like cells. So the parietal cells, they're actually going to make two different things. The parietal cells are going to secrete acid, specifically hydrochloric acid, into the lumen of the stomach. We'll talk about what that's for in a little bit. They also make something called intrinsic factor. The ECL cells produce primarily histamine. Same kind of stuff that's produced in um, allergic responses. And histamine <clears throat> actually primarily acts on these parietal cells, telling them to secrete more acid. 
So we've kind of got this <coughs> multiple, multiple phases here. The chief cells, also over here, they produce two enzymes. One of them, uh, let's see, we're running out of room here, so we'll just bring this down here. One of the enzymes they produce is gastric lipase, so it's a lipase, a fat digesting enzyme. The other is something called pepsinogen. Keep that one in mind. We're going to come back to that. <clears throat> so, what all of this has led to is the production of these things. Hydrochloric acid, an intrinsic factor from the parietal cells, pepsinogen and gastric lipase from the chief cells through the actions of the G cells and the ECL cells. So let's focus in on these, but let's take this away and focus in on the parietal and chief cells. Now first we're gonna take a look at a parietal cell. So this is in the gastric gland in the stomach. It's receiving signals from gastrin and from histamine from the enterochromaffin-like cells. So it's going to produce acid. The way these produce acid will look familiar. It actually is kind of similar to what you get in the type A cells in the, in the DCT. We end up with carbon dioxide from the blood coming into the cell. These cells contain the enzyme carbonic anhydrase, so CO2 and water produce proton and bicarbonate. The bicarbonate is going to end up coming out in exchange for chloride coming in. Remember the bicarbonate chloride antiport. You saw something you saw a similar protein, actually the same one, on red blood cells. The proton is going to get pushed actively into the lumen in exchange for potassium being cycled in. This is an ATP using active transport. That potassium is then actually going to come back out through potassium channels. So just to restate this so far, carbon dioxide from the blood comes into the parietal cell. With carbonic anhydrase, we convert that into proton and bicarbonate. The bicarbonate leaves in exchange for chloride coming in. We'll come back to that chloride. The proton is actively pushed into the lumen in exchange for a potassium being brought in. That's on an active transport pump. The potassium then can come out through apical potassium channels. So notice what we've done here. In the end, I, this transporter is electrically neutral. So is this one. But as that potassium comes out, my net result is that I've moved one positive charge out here into the lumen. So now I've created an electrical difference. It's more positive out here than in here, which means that chloride actually has an electrical force pulling it out through chloride channels on the apical membrane. And what I end up with down here in the lumen is hydrochloric acid, H plus and Cl minus. So this is how the parietal cells end up pushing hydrochloric acid into the stomach. Now, this, pro this proton mover, this proton potassium active exchange pump, sometimes called the proton pump, is a target of some pharmaceuticals. If you've heard of people being prescribed proton pump inhibitors for, ex for reflux, that's the proton pump that's getting inhibited. So that's kind of interesting. Anyway, so that's how parietal cells produce acid in this gastric phase. And when encouraged to do so by gastrin and by histamine and by some other things, they can pump quite a bit of hydrochloric acid into the stomach. They'll take this stomach and make the pH down around two or so, which is pretty strongly acidic. Now, keep in mind, remember in my saliva, I had two enzymes in the saliva, a salivary amylase, which was starting to break down starch, and a um, lingual lipase. 
The amylase works well in the saliva, but when it gets down here into the stomach and is exposed to this acid, that's going to denature that salivary amylase. So it's going to stop working. So the salivary amylase stops working. because of that low pH. The lingual lipase actually works better at more acidic pHs. So as it enters the stomach, it actually starts being more effective in terms of fat digestion. Now, the other thing that these parietal cells make is something called intrinsic factor. This is a protein. And its job is to bind to vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is kind of interesting stuff. It actually, it involves an atom of cobalt, uh, kind of a heavy metal, but it's supposed to be there. Vitamin B12 is made really only by bacteria. Uh, there, as far as I know, there are no animals or plants that can make their own vitamin B12. So it's made by bacteria. Then those are integrated into plants and then those the bacteria live with the plants Herbivores eat the plants and bring in the vitamin B12, which then accumulates in their bodies, and then other things eat those herbivores. And that's kind of how vitamin B12 makes its way up to up through the food chain from those bacteria originally. We need vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is important in almost every cell in the body. It's an important part of metabolism. It's an important part of red blood cell production. It's an important part of how neurons make myelin. Really, everything needs vitamin B12. So... Vitamin B12 is vulnerable to stomach acid. Stomach acid can destroy it. So one of the things this intrinsic factor does is sort of catch the vitamin B12 and protect it from the stomach acid and then hold on to it. As that vitamin B12 travels down through here, bound to the intrinsic factor and enters the intestines, later on in the intestines, there's really only two ways for vitamin B12 to be absorbed into our bodies. One of them, it can come in by just passive diffusion, but only a very, very tiny percentage of the vitamin B12 that we take in can come in that way. Most of it has to be actively transported out of the intestine and into the body, but that active transport looks for not vitamin B12, but vitamin B12 bound to intrinsic factor. If the B12 is not bound to the intrinsic factor, those transporters won't transport it, which is why if your stomach is not producing enough vitamin B12, you may be eating enough in your diet, but without that intrinsic factor, your intestines can absorb only a very tiny fraction of it. So you may end up with deficiency in vitamin B12 without that intrinsic factor. Kind of interesting. Anyway, so the parietal cells produce acid and vitamin B12. Now let's take a look at those chief cells. Sorry, uh, acid and intrinsic factor. They don't produce vitamin B12. The chief cells produce those two enzymes. They produce gastric lipase, which along with the more active, um, the lingual lipase that's been activated by the acid, does some fat digestion. Not a lot. Most fat digestion actually does not occur in the stomach. Most of it happens further on in the intestines, but a little bit happens here. But the other thing they produce is pepsinogen. Now, notice the name, ogen. Remember what that means. Something that ends in ogen is probably an inactive version of something else. Pepsinogen is a protein, but what it really is is an enzyme with a safety cap. Kind of like hormones had safety caps when they were pro-hormones. Sometimes people call this a pro-enzyme. Another, en another name for it is a zymogen, but we'll get to that in the intestines. But pepsinogen is an inactive form of the enzyme pepsin. The acid in the stomach activates it, helps it to remove the safety cap. So this becomes pepsin. Pepsin is what's known as a, is an endopeptidase, if you remember that. An endopeptidase is an enzyme which breaks the bonds between amino acids in the middle of the chain. 
So as the pro as proteins come down the esophagus and here into the stomach, acid denatures the proteins. Remember that under different pH they unfold. So acid is going to unfold our protein, and then pepsinogen, which gets converted into pepsin, is going to start snipping that unfolded chain, breaking the protein up into smaller amino acid chains. That's actually going to prepare it for digestion later. But this is where protein digestion really begins. And pepsin is a pretty effective enzyme. Uh, especially, it seems to work especially well on collagen, which is that tough protein that forms connective tissue, uh, which takes a while to break down. So that starts early on here in the stomach. Anyway, it digests other proteins too. So those chief cells have produced these two enzymes. Our parietal cells produced acid and intrinsic factor. All of that happening here in the stomach. So our stomach churns on this stuff. And how long things stay in the stomach is actually not a question with a simple answer, but a few hours, somewhere between two and five hours generally, the stomach will be doing motility, churning around, mixing all of this stuff with these acid and enzymes, and getting digestion of fats and proteins started. Carbohydrate digestion, which started in the saliva and the oral cavity, has stopped here because that enzyme has been denatured by the acid stomach. The acid here is also good for killing my, most microorganisms. So, after my stomach has been working on this for a while, we're going to try to move some of this stuff out through this pyloric sphincter and into the first part of the intestine, the duodenum. But there's a, there's a problem here. This stuff in here is very, it's a very hostile environment, strongly acidic with some pretty aggressive enzymes. The stomach lining can protect itself from that. It has a layer of mucus with some bicarbonate underneath it to help neutralize any acid that gets in toward the stomach walls. But even so, stomach lining regenerates itself every something like three days. The cells in the stomach lining are very active in terms of cell division. They're constantly producing new cells to replace damaged and shed stomach lining. So that very, very hostile stuff, as it gets squeezed out through that pyloric sphincter into the duodenum, it's entering an area that can't protect itself as well. The duodenum doesn't have all the same ways of protecting itself against that acid, just like the esophagus doesn't, which is why reflux, reflux can hurt. Um, actually, we should take, take a moment to have a side note on that. So as we squeeze this stuff out into the duodenum when we're done with it, the duodenum is going to need to regulate how quickly it receives this acidic chyme. The, remember, the name for the food after it's been mixed with this is chyme. As that is squeezed into the duodenum, the duodenum is going to have to tell the stomach, whoa, slow down, and take it just a little at a time so it can neutralize that acid and then start working on the chyme. Now, just a note about... Uh, reflux. This lower esophageal sphincter doesn't always close very well, so it's relatively easy for the stomach contents, this strongly acidic stuff, to get squeezed up through that es lower esophageal sphincter and into the esophagus, which presents a couple of problems. One, the esophagus is not very well protected against acid, so as that acid comes up here, near, it can start to damage the wall of the esophagus. If it's down here in the lower part, uh, that produces that feeling of heartburn that you get sometimes with some kinds of reflux. It has nothing to do with your heart, it just happens to be about at that location where the acid is coming up out of the stomach. If it gets higher up, and if it gets up there regularly, what can happen is that this pepsin enzyme, this protein attacking enzyme, can get pushed up into here and kind of stick in the walls of the esophagus. Now interestingly, Pepsin only works at an acidic pH. So if we deposit pepsin up in there, once the acid leaves and this area doesn't, isn't as acidic, the pepsin stops working very well. But then every time we get more acid up there, the pepsin can reactivate, can fold back up properly and start damaging the esophagus again. So there are some differences in reflux between the temporary reflux you get down here and the sort of the chronic long-term reflux, but we're not going to get into that right now. What we're ready for now, now that we've talked about what goes on in the stomach, is to get into what's happening here in the duodenum at the first part of the intestinal phase of digestion, which will be our next part.